Hello everyone, uh, this is Catholic Game Reviews. I am Matt Pilardi, known to many of you as PBN Justice. Um, before I introduce our guest, I just wanted to open with a quick prayer that might be familiar to some of you who've played the game. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which you are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord, Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So uh, joining me today is Josh Sawyer. As a design director for Obsidian Studios, he's been behind the writing and systems for games such as Fallout New Vegas, Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2, and a game that's recently captivated us at CGR, Pentiment. Josh, welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being here. Um, so we're going to be going into some intense questions later on, so I wanted to warm you up with some more lowball questions first. Sure. So <clears throat> first off, um, how do you like your eggs? Hard over hard. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I do not like I do not like runny yolks. I know that puts me kind of in a minority, but uh, yeah, I uh, any I I have eggs fairly frequently, mm -hmm. and uh, I always crack them and just br I, I get it out of the way. I'm like, let me mess up these yolks, mm -hmm. nice and hard, mm -hmm. no surprises. No, so I yeah, totally over hard. That. <laughs> yeah, and then the next question also breakfast related: pulp or no pulp? As much pulp as possible, honestly. All right. There you go. <laughs> you like to chew it a little bit. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. No, yeah. I really like high pulp. Some people get freaked out by it, but I like it a lot. No, that's all good. Um, so so it was a few months ago at this point. I, I'm not sure if they're still doing it because I haven't really looked in the chip aisle. But uh, <laughs> Xbox was running this snack food promotion where they had like Starfield and Redfall branded Doritos. <laughs> so if you had to sell a pentiment branded snack food what would it be um that's a really difficult question to answer i feel like it would have to, food is so um yeah. featured in the game uh i'd have to think about it but yeah i would go and look at the kinds of food that we had mm -hmm. and i might like maybe it could be like an emmental cheese like a pr mm -hmm. promotional cheese okay uh okay. or bergkäse uh, yeah. which is sort of the mountain cheese, the shepherd's cheese. Um, could be frumenti, that's sort of like, we, we could go something like that. I, I'd have to think about it and look to find what's the truly the truly emblematic food, but yeah. I, I feel like it would be pulled from one of the meals. Yeah, I mean, if we were going like with like main brands, I could picture like wheat thins or like triscuits, but like... That's like pulling from like very main brand, like based on the game. I mean, I feel like a rye bread would make sense too. Like if we're pulling straight. Yeah, the actually, yeah, a bread. We could do a bread collaboration. That yeah, could be good. I think that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. Um, so while researching for the interview, I noticed you have some medieval styled iconography tattoos on your arms. Um, so what are those tattoos of? And if you're okay with it, what significance do they have for you? Oh, there's a few. Um, uh, probably the most relevant one is I do have a tattoo of Joan of Arc on my right forearm, and that was taken from a, uh, uh, it was an illustration by, I want to say a late 19th century, maybe an early 20th century English historian uh, who had done an illustration that I really liked, and I got that. There's another on my other arm that looks medieval, but it's only in a medieval style. Mm -hmm. It is by the late... Pauline Baines, who um, some people may know as the illustrator for C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Um, and then later she was an illustrator for some of J.R.R. Tolkien's works. Mm -hmm. And the tattoo is actually of Smith of Wooten Major, who is a character from a uh, lesser known J.R.R. Tolkien short story. Um, That's one of the ones I have not yet read, which is like kicking me. Like, because I've been meaning to, I've read... Oh, well, now I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's a oh, uh, Leaf by Niggle, that one. That's okay. a really good one. I would recommend that. You can read it in an afternoon, and it's a really great. Uh, it's the most allegorical Tolkien gets, which is funny because he hates allegory. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> Tol uh, the Smith of Wooten Major is also another one. You you can read it in maybe an hour. It's it's quite brisk. So mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> Um, so you got a degree in history with a focus on the Holy Roman Empire. Why did you focus on that era of history in particular? You know, um, I had always been interested in European history. And, um, you know, it sort of initially was maybe medieval or late medieval. And then 
uh, in college, I started getting interested more into early modern history. So the transition between the the medieval period and the modern period, or what we understand as the modern period. Mm -hmm. And I think transitional periods in history in general are just interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of change going on. There's a lot of people fighting against the change, <laughs> and uh, it 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 kind of. Um, you know, takes different forms in different places. So, uh, yeah, initially I thought I might study um, Reconquista Spain. That was, I think, very early on. And I don't know really what it was or if I really examined it, but it shifted, it shifted more, it shifted later um, and it shifted north and went into uh, Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, as we now know it. Um, and yeah, I I have some sort of you know like family connections to Germany and Austria, and uh, language interest from music. I initially went to school for music, mm -hmm. so doing something in a German speaking area seemed appropriate, and I just had other sort of pre existing interests in that region. Mm -hmm. So all those things kind of just came together. Um, so I, I have a little bit of English history, mm -hmm. and a little bit of. Um, you know, like maybe, you know, Reconquista era and a little bit of Renaissance Italy, but most of my studies were focused on early modern Holy Roman Empire. Okay. I'm excited for the spiritual sequel to Pentiment in Reconquista <laughs> Spain. I probably just said that wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this is probably like these next few are probably the heaviest hitting ones, but they're kind of like sure. the backbone for the rest of it. So um, back in 2012, you indicated you didn't believe in any God. In any God. Is that still the case? That is the case, yes. Okay. Um, what belief system were you raised in, and how would you describe your faith journey? Now, I know you just said you don't believe in any God, but, you know, I think, you know, I think you acknowledge, based on things you've said before, that there is a spiritual dimension to people. So just, you can answer it from that perspective. Sure. Um, I was raised in a household where both of my parents had been raised in different religious traditions. My mm -hmm. father was raised Catholic. And my mother was raised a uh, Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran. Um, and actually, I might be wrong on that, but she was raised Lutheran. I can't mm -hmm. remember if it was Missouri Synod or, or Wisconsin Synod. But um, to be honest, without revealing too much about my dad's own personal life, um, mm -hmm. he did not have a good experience with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, uh, quite negative. And mm -hmm. because of that, he really did not want to make me go to church. Um, and so I was raised in a household that was not, um, well, my dad was kind of antagonistic towards religious organizations, but like not hostile towards religion in general, mm -hmm. but, um, I didn't go to church growing up and most of the, I grew up in rural Wisconsin. And so I knew a lot of, especially Protestants. Um, but I also knew a fair number of Catholics. Uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't an extreme minority. Um, so I knew many religious people around me, mostly again, uh, Lutheran and Catholic, mm -hmm. very few non Christian traditions overall. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that I didn't really, like I thought about it, at, you know, in the way that a kid might, um, you know, it wasn't like I had super advanced thoughts or anything. And then over time, you know, I sort of uh, started reading more about Christianity and learning more about it in the context of history. Um, and I remember thinking more about agnosticism and atheism in um, in college to kind of think more about where I stood on it because I found that there were a lot of discussions that felt very fruitless because they became sort of arguments about definitions, mm -hmm. which I don't really find that useful. And so what I came away with was a statement that I heard echoed by other people that have a similar outlook, which is, I don't believe that there are any uh, identifiable higher powers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and, and I, and more importantly, I live my life as though there is no one sort of above, uh, presciently sort of like seeing what I'm doing, um, and judging me based on it. So there's a lot of ways you could put a label on that, but that's pretty much what it comes down to. And I don't think it really changed much about, um, I don't think it changed much about how I lived my life, although I do think that thinking through that changed kind of how I interacted with 
people identifying by faith um, or lack of faith or things like that because uh, it just sort of simplified and clarified where I stand on things. And um, I do think that my viewpoint is as much of an act of faith as anybody else's, really. I don't think like I have some special insight or anything. This is just the conclusion that I've come to in my life to this point. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's totally a respectable answer. And honestly, it was one that I was both expecting, but also one I, that I find fascinating because a lot of us find Pentiment to be like so authentically Catholic that it, I, I mean, thank you. It's it's basically just a, you know, you did a great job with it to the point where it's like, I know he said this, but like, man, like they did a really <laughs> good job. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, I will say so. I think. Um, you know, in studying religious history, you have to, at a certain point, you have to wrestle with, do you believe that the people <laughs> that you're reading about believe the things that they believed sincerely? And um, because at times, especially one of the first major things that I studied was witch hunting and the history of witch hunting, mm -hmm. which I should say is not a Catholic only phenomenon. It was Catholic, yes. And then as soon as Protestantism came into existence, Protestants also engaged in witch hunting. And there's a lot of ways that you can read it as cynical um, or just in a lot of ways insincere. And when you read a lot of the accounts of these people, or when you read a lot of the accounts of people who were accused of, whether it was heresy or witchcraft, um, you do have to grapple with whether or not you believe that the people who are giving testimony are un not under duress, because that's always under question, yeah. but whether they were sin sincere about their beliefs. And if they were sincere about their beliefs, you have to kind of examine the place from which that comes. And I think that my conclusion is, yes, they sincerely believed these things, and it was a core of their life. And to reduce it to something... Um, else is, I think, intellectually dishonest. And also, um, it makes it very hard to understand people mm -hmm. <laughs> and what they do. And so I feel like the only way to portray religious people in a religious society is to try to really see things from their perspective and portray mm -hmm. that as sincerely as you can. So I'm glad that it comes across that way because I, 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 do, try to, I do try to treat them and people with these beliefs as uh, – with respect, even though they're not my beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way to have like any authentic writing too. Like you can't think write so, any yeah. person believably <laughs> without like actually like, you know, like digging, like taking their position, like even if you don't believe it for like, just like, you know, I, I forget what the phrase exactly is, but like just like pretending to take it on for a second so you can get in the character's head, you know? Sure. So absolutely. yeah, that totally makes sense to me. And speaking about characters, um, why do you think faith-filled characters keep coming up for you? Like Joshua Graham as well, and then all of the characters basically in Pentiment. Um, so many many writers ignore or forget to write anything of a spiritual dimension to their characters, and I was just wondering why faith-filled characters come up a lot for you. I think, I think it's a combination of things. It's because my background kind of required me to learn about that stuff in a historical context. And then... Um, noticing that religion in games either is not in games, like it's either absent, mm -hmm. uh, or I didn't feel like it was handled well, sometimes with overt disrespect, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it just felt or still feels. I, I don't think the gaming industry has a terrific track record with it. Um, you know, it feels kind of disrespectful or, or inconsiderate, not not as well-researched as, as one might want. And so, for example, um, Honest Hearts, which I think I made a number of mistakes in, especially when it comes to native representation, which uh, I messed up there. There's not really a whole lot I can say for it, um, or I've already tried to say as much as I can for it and just try to be better in the future. But with at, with respect to how we portrayed um, you know, a Mormon or, or a religious character at all, which in in the Fallout series ha had not really been a strong point or even a point at all. Um, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to try to do that. I remember early on, I said, my goal with this is to try to show faith in a post, uh, uh, a Christian faith in a post-apocalyptic environment. Mm -hmm. You know, Mormonism is a very specific 
uh, outlook on it, but I thought it would be interesting to see how that group would try to continue within within a post-apocalyptic world. Um, and yes, and I think I, I learned a lot from doing that. And then with Pentiment, uh, it was more that I wanted to I wanted to do something set in 16th century Europe, the Holy Roman Empire, and I feel like you you can't you can't really do that unless mm -hmm. unless the characters are in some ways grappling or not grappling, but like they're just religious. They're that's the foundation of how they understand the world. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get a spectrum of that. And I, I hope I did portray a spectrum of it that seems plausible and believable, just like right now <laughs> there are people that that grapple with their faith and live and change with their faith in different ways. So uh, yeah, it was less about making a point and more about 16th century, you know, Bavaria, this is very Catholic. And so the society and the characters should, should reflect that as well as I can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I do think that's a really interesting point about like Joshua Graham and um, like quite literally post-apocalyptic, like this was like a world, like a, a seismic event that happened that changed the entire world. So like, yeah, how would that change? Like, would people have thought like Christ has come or, so on and so forth like how does how do those belief systems like change after that yeah that's a fascinating uh fascinating thing to look at um thank you so i know joshua graham wasn't named after you but so <laughs> just know that when i ask like how much of sawyer is in graham one of the things that so uh that graham says a lot is he kind of talks through his doubts despite you know being a man of faith a lot of the times when he's talking to the courier he's you know, saying like, oh, you have your doubts. I used to have things like that too. Um, so I just was wondering like how much of Sawyer's in Graham? Were you kind of writing through some of your own doubts? Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say a whole lot of me is in Joshua Graham, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people have actually accused me of, of arcade Gannon being my stand-in in New Vegas, mm -hmm. which is also not true, but I would say there's more of me in uh, there's more of me in Arcade than there is in Joshua Graham. Um, no, I, I don't think I was working through my own doubts with Joshua Graham, but I was also recognizing that Joshua Graham was a character who had fallen in multiple senses mm -hmm. and had come back into a life of faith that he was still struggling with. Mm -hmm. And even though he says at certain points like, yes, I dealt with that in the past, as you progress through honest hearts it's clear that he's he's still mm -hmm. struggling with certain aspects of his faith and how he views things like vengeance or violence and things like that um and uh so yeah i wouldn't say it was so much about me as much as recognizing where joshua graham was as a a person who had gone through a, a big arc and in mm -hmm. some in some ways in some ways was a prodigal son um but, you know, okay, well, you've returned, but now you're done returning. Now mm -hmm. you're now you're actively engaging in the world, and how, how do you continue to do that? And part of the resolution of Honest Hearts is supposed to be you kind of helping guide, like, hey, man, like, don't do this. <laughs> or like, mm -hmm. no, no, yeah, go ahead, go do that. Um, and that's, that's really the perspective it, I came at it from. Um, yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry, actually, there's one more thing I would add, which I feel like, um, you know, if there is... If there is one thing that players have seen in a lot of video games, it's a um, no doubt zealot, right? Uh. Like that sort of character I could archetype a character who is um, like without without doubt and extreme and like with no subtlety and no nuance. I feel like if there are religious characters in games, often they are very over the top and extreme and have no nuance to them. And I thought that that was another aspect of why it was important to have a very religious character who wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. He's very religious and he believes things very deeply, but he also has enough introspection to, you know, recognize the things that he's done and also doubt the things that he's even currently doing. So uh, I think that was also another important part of it. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of that comes from like how, how can religion be gamified, if that makes sense? So like if you're thinking about it from an RPG perspective, it's like 
you're thinking, oh, well, where's the source of magic come from for a paladin or, <laughs> you know, a cleric? It's like, okay, well, it's got to be from gods. And if they have doubts, then it's like, well, then how would their magic be powerful or things like that? So it kind of like, it's kind of one thing feeding into the other of how, like, well, why would we have a like a doubting paladin? Which is interesting to play in, in things like D&D to role play. But like mechanically, it's, it's like, I, I can imagine people questioning that. So yeah, it's definitely one of the struggles I've seen with gaming, um, which, you know, I think has been slowly getting better in some ways, but you know, um, for, for, for every like nuanced take, there's also plenty of ones that are like Warhammer 40 K where it's like, we're, you know, the, the space church army. I don't know. I don't really know too much about Warhammer 40 K yeah. <laughs> besides the space Marines really. Yeah. Um, so in regards to Pillars of Eternity, um, do you see fantasy settings as a space to explore moral ideas, which are like more difficult to survey in reality? Or is it just like, oh, I want to do a fantasy setting this time around? I think that there are different sorts of questions that come up. And I don't, I won't say that we necessarily, or I'll, I'll say I, have explored those questions maybe in the, the best way or the most ideal way. But I think that there's something interesting when you have a world where there's a couple of things. One, you have powers that are like overtly manifesting right now, not in mm -hmm. the distant past, not referred to and passed down through traditions of faith, but like, no, this dude did this. Like we <laughs> saw it, like a bunch of us saw it and like see evidence of it a lot um, where deities communicate directly with people. Um, but then also, like one in one thing that I did intentionally is I noted that um, the sources of power for priests and paladins in the world is faith and zeal for priests and paladins respectively, capital F, capital Z. And it is actually personal. So you can actually be heretical, <laughs> but uh. intense and like you still got it. And you don't really have the compass of, well, the you know, you're, you don't have powers anymore. That means that you're wrong and God is not giving you powers. It is based in faith, rooted in the deity, but it is actually a personal belief system that, that powers it. Mm -hmm. And what I like about that is that without direct confirmation from the deity, which is rare for most people, unless you're the watcher of Cadnua, um, then there's going to be the potential for just ambiguity and infighting and conflict, uh, which is, I think, an interesting aspect of of doctrine and orthodoxy and and the very human organizations that exist around faith. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and actually, speaking of mechanizing stuff like that, um, in the Pillars tabletop game, which I have not released a new update for in a long time, but there are actually rules for... Um, basically becoming a, a heretic and then founding your own founding your own um splinter group basically or sub faction uh that contravenes the the principles of the order that you left and some of the some of the most notable paladin orders actually did emerge from other ones like the gold pact knights emerged essentially as a heretical offshoot of the kind wayfarers <laughs> because the kind wayfarers said basically i mean i'm simplifying but you know we do this for no money and the gold pack pal knight said but what if we did <laughs> <laughs> um so um and because it's from zeal itself um as long as the adherents believe it they will get powers so you can't point to above and say like well clearly they don't like it well we don't know if they like it or not um so and there's you know we do try to explore some of that in a, from another dimension such as uh, Adair the character Adair is one of the more devout especially for a non like he's not a priest he's not a paladin but he has very deep faith rooted in Aethys, which in some ways could be viewed as a as a the closest faith to Christianity I don't think it's that close but like of all the faiths in Aora Aethasians are probably the closest for a number of reasons but. You know, one of the things that Adair kind of struggles with, or and it's it's more of a subtextual thing, is you were brought up in a faith, believing in these things as moral and ethical principles of life, like in themselves, and that was conveyed through the faith. the The deity of that faith is gone. 
does the moral and ethical imperative still exist without the deity telling you mm. or any sort of overt promise of reward or retribution for adhering or not adhering to that faith? And so, you know, basically, like, if, if, if God isn't there, are these things still, is this still how I should live my life? Because I believe that they were given from God, but that they were also inherently true. Mm -hmm. So um, for a character who is not actually a priest or a paladin, I think that's sort of an interesting perspective to take on it, um, which in some ways could be viewed as if you are an atheist, <laughs> because this is often a thing leveled at people who, who either self-identify as atheists or essentially live as atheists. Is, can one live morally or ethically mm -hmm. um, outside of religion? Um, I would hope so, but you know, a character in a fantasy world can also engage with that from a different perspective, which is no one saying, well, pretty much no one is saying that atheists didn't exist, but we're saying that atheists is gone. So what about the precepts of faith? Mm -hmm. It's a more of like a deistic type perspective. Yeah. 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 No, that's interesting. And I like that way of solving that situation that I just mentioned. Cause it's like, you know, in fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, like there's, there's no real atheists, you know? It's like you you see divine intervention all the time. <laughs> so that's a great way of doing it, and I like that it's the <laughs> strength of one's conviction. Um, real quick, we're going to get into a bunch of Pentiment questions now, but for those of you who will eventually be watching, um, there aren't story spoilers in the below questions, but we are going to be diving deep into the themes of the game. So we heavily recommend you play the game. Um, so, and if you want to stay like completely spoiler free, like carte blanche, just, uh, I just return to this part, this part, this part later. <clears throat> so, um, in a video you did on the remote development of Pentiment, you mentioned having weekly meetings where you'd watched reference movies. I was wondering if you specifically watched A Hidden Life. It was Terrence Malick's latest film. You know, we talked about it, um, and I really, and but we couldn't, we couldn't find a place to stream it um, within the within the frame of when we were working on it. Um, I really, really want to see it in life because Terrence Malick is incredible. That story looks amazing. Uh, that actor, whose name I can't remember, but he's in Inglorious Bastards and a number of other yeah. things. He's he's just an amazing actor. So it looks it looks amazing, and I did see the. Um, there is a, one scene that I've seen, which is of the painter in the church, um, which is an, an incredible scene. So I really want to watch it. Unfortunately, we did not get a chance to watch it for Pentiment Research. That's fine. You, it's like you're reading right from my questions because I was just about <laughs> to say there's that scene where he has a discussion with an artist uh, where the arts, artist says he paints their comfortable Christ instead of the true one that demands something of them. And that reminded me a lot of the struggle for truth that's all throughout Pentiment. And I just wanted to ask, you know, generally as well, what were some key messages you were trying to impart through Pentiment, whether consciously or subconsciously? Um, you know, some of them were not religious in nature, but they were about um, history and the fragility of history. Uh, you know, Umberto Echoes, The Name of the Rose, was a, a big inspiration for the game. But also uh, uh, books like uh, Bottolino, which is also by Echo. And both of those, both of those stories... Um, they really emphasize how tenuous our grasp on the past is because whether it's verbal or written down, it's all passed along as a tradition and we become, we become whether willingly or not, sort of guardians and transmitters of that for future generations. Um, you know, the, the late Hillary Mantle said something about history, which is like, history is not what happened. History is what remains of what people wrote down about what happened the way that they wanted to tell us. <laughs> Which is, you know, when you really break that down, it's so fragile and so fragmentary um, that we have very limited insight into things. There are whole sections of time and places that we know nothing about, or that we have one, you know, we have one written record <laughs> and no archeological records. And that is an extremely, ext there's a lot of faith involved in accepting that or, or doubting that. Um, so looking at, for example, the history of Kearsaw and the Abbey, and there's a lot of stuff that's overt in it, but there's also a lot of subtle things like, for example, you know, late in the game, you see an illustration of the founding of the Abbey. It doesn't look like what the Abbey looks like now. 
Does that mean that the Abbey was laid out differently in the past? Does it mean that the artist took liberties with how they portrayed it? Who knows? You have no idea. There's no way to know that. And there's there's other things like that that are subtle. The way that, um, and we don't draw attention to them because that's not the point, but the way that people will tell and retell stories, they differ. And, um, but they're, they're just people. They're not necessarily trying to push some sort of falsehood. Um, you know, you see it, especially between act one and act two, more pointedly, when you come back and if you talk to Nico about what happened in the first act, the way that he tells it is never the way that you saw it happened <laughs> there. You saw it happen. Um, and you can call him out on it, but like, and he's not being malicious. It's just someone told someone who told someone who told him, and then he remembered it maybe the way they told it, or maybe he remembered it differently. And then maybe you talk to someone else and it changed. And that's, you know, whether it's oral or written, it's uh, it's a very fragile thing. And so uh, we we accept what we know on about history on faith based on everyone who came before us. And, and you know, sometimes we have a new discovery, you know, where we maybe we discover in a palimpsest that Archimedes invented the foundations of calculus 2,000 years <laughs> before Isaac Newton in a 15th century French hymnal. Um, <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but yeah, there's just so much that's lost that we have to, uh, you know, we really have to examine our assumptions about what history is and what the truth of what happened was. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, so in that video, the remote development video that you had talked about maintaining the esprit de corps of the team once COVID hit. So as the director, how did you handle that switch, like emotionally and logistically? And was there any spiritual difficulty that came about while working on this game? I mean, I think that the 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 sort of more spiritual crisis or emotional crisis was uh, the ones that everyone was dealing with, right? I mean, we were, we were very isolated. Um, I couldn't. I'm I'm very used to going to work every day. Even now, even though we we can work remotely still, I still like going into the office. I just I like not being in my house all the time. Um, and uh, so not really being able to go very many places, not being able to meet with people face to face, uh, I am quite accustomed to informal conversations with people. Um, and that becomes harder when it, you need to actually initiate a call and other people are in different time zones. Um, so I, I'm very grateful that the team size was very small uh, because we all knew each other, I would say pretty well. And I could talk to people pretty regularly and frequently. And that made it a lot easier. And, um, you know, we did have a few events that allowed us to actually meet up physically a couple times, which I think really made a huge difference. But, um, you know, I don't think we ever reached any true crisis points. Um, I think we all considered ourselves lucky that we had jobs. We had jobs that we could do remotely, that we had a small team, that we had already, and we had, I think, we had not quite entered production, but we had a really good trajectory. Um, many, many teams around the world were incredibly disrupted by COVID. And I'm just so grateful that, you know, we were on a good course and had a small team and it was minimally disruptive. And in some ways in the long term, helpful because we were able, we had the infrastructure to bring on people from, you know, well into Europe, like way ahead of us in time. Uh, that were really critical to helping us get the game done. So yeah, it. Um, I think we fared a lot better than a lot of teams, and I think it's because we went into it better than a lot of teams did. Okay, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so sort of related to a question we had already asked, but what made you want to tell this story in particular? Um, you know, I, I liked, I always loved the setup of the name of the Rose, <laughs> Murder in an Abbey, um, and featuring lots of monks, but I wanted to set it later. And so when you get later into, you know, into the early modern period, um, monasteries are not doing well. I mean, obviously you have England where they do extremely not well. Um, but even elsewhere within Europe, you know, you have the Reformation made made a made a lot of changes, um, and you know the history of monastic orders, starting with Benedict of Nursia and the Benedictines. There's this constant desire to found new orders and Reformation movements, and 
And then those ones don't necessarily work so well. And so there's like new ones that come out of it. Mm. Um, so I liked seeing a an Abbey that was kind of in some ways quite old fashioned relative to other monastic orders that might be more recent. Um, and also more old fashioned in the sense of, um, you know, being a double monastery, which at this point in time, they existed, but they were quite rare because the Pope had made it clear <laughs> to not do this anymore. Um, and, you know, I love the idea of places in transition. So I had a number of things that were in flux where I wanted to tell stories that were in a certain way quite medieval about groups and organizations that felt truly medieval in their character, but also I wanted to talk about the emergence of the early modern world. And so the idea of having Kearsaw Abbey being Benedictine, still having, uh, you know, this hanging on by a thread scriptorium <laughs> that's like everyone's like why are you guys nobody's doing this anymore this is all professionals now we got printing presses and everything um and professional guilds of artists that can do this um but also having monks and nuns in part because i wanted to i didn't want to just have monks you know i, I wanted to also show how the women lived and how it was similar in many ways but not exactly and it, it was different um and I did want to show peasant life and emerging middle-class life and how those in some ways were similar, in some ways were different, a really wide spectrum of society, lots of different characters. And so by having Andreas as an artist who, and there are some liberties taken here because lay people would you know, work within a monastic environment, but it was a little more formal than Andreas just walk, you know, walking in in his street clothes, basically. Like they had to actually adopt the, the clothing and mm -hmm. observe things a little more strictly. Um, but having this character who moves between both worlds, like he lives in the town among the peasantry, but he works in this abbey. And the abbey is, uh, through Father Garnett, really you know, trying to stick to, this is the way that we've done things. We're going to keep doing it this way. Um, and then the town, one, increasing restrictions, which were common across Southern Germany at this time, um, you know, are, they're, they're really rebelling against that. And they're trying to, you could say move forward, but in their minds, it was really going back to the way that it used to be. Uh, but the way that those, ab or rather those lords had ruled, whether they were uh, ecclesiastical or sec well secular, um, you know it, it it had changed, and they were like, "Hey, why are we, <laughs> why are being being taxed this way? Like, why?" Um, so I just thought it was very interesting to tell the story of these two groups in conflict with this this man who was moving between them, and clearly Andreas has a lot of sympathies and friendships within the abbey, even if he's kind of set up to be in conflict with the abbot in a number of cases. Um, and he has a lot of friendships within the town, even though there are clearly some really awful people at work in the town as well. So I just thought it was an interesting way to kind of bridge those worlds and show how there is conflict not only between them, but also just between the the old way of doing things and the emerging world. Yeah, it was a great way to get like a real cross slice of that piece of history, because I mean, it's a lot of elements interacting. And I think it's, Thank you. I think it's woven together very believably. Thank you. Um, so the game has much to say about pursuing your vocation and occasionally struggling with what you once felt called to do. I'm thinking particularly of, I'm going to forget the names because I played it in November. and I'm, There's a lot of characters. <laughs> there's a lot of characters. I'm already bad with real people's names. You know? um, but the sister and monk who, spoilers for people, uh, leave in Act 2. They Act 2? Yes, Act, act 2. Act 3. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Matilda. Yeah, Matilda yes. and Warslav. So um, they talk about, at one point, they say, um, I have the exact quote in my review too, but basically, <laughs> like, never let anyone convince you that, um, like, you know, you have to stick to your vocation and remain in sin. And that's a paraphrase of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I just really found that, uh, yeah, just really great. And so I was just wondering, like, what advice do you have maybe for those struggling with their vocation? And, you know, I guess what place did that character come from uh, in writing? I know you weren't the only narrative designer for uh, Pentiment, but yeah. I did act, well, you know, m to be honest, most of the religious characters that, that really talk a lot about their faith, I wrote almost all those characters. Um, okay. So I, I did write Matilda um, for the most part. 
Um, and so it came from, again, wanting to show, again, the spectrum of devotion and um, ease of adaptation and struggling with adaptation. And also that um, you know, people change over time mm -hmm. and their relationship to the world around them and their inner world changes as well. And um, for some people, it makes sense to try to, they're going to reconcile it in one way and they're going to reconcile it toward the cloistered life, toward their vocation. And other people aren't. And there are people that leave, you know, for either more or less, you know, like dramatic reasons than Matilda. Um, but not everyone who uh, takes vows stays in that vocation for their entire life. Sometimes yeah, it, it changes. Yeah, it changes a little or a lot. Um, and for a lot of different reasons. And I think I think there is a person. To the extent that people understand um, monks and, and nuns and their vows, and even I would say there's a lot of, there's so much to know. There's so much to know about that about that life, even within a single order that I can't possibly know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are people like Matilda who, Matilda is not, um, you know, she's not uh, irreverent. She's not... Um, like Zdena is a character that I think many could view as being a lot more kind of a spoiled character and a little more capricious about, you know, she's like mad to be there. She's, she's like upset that she is a nun. Um, and she's very rebellious about it and kind of has a devil may care attitude. Matilda is not like that. It's not that Matilda dislikes being a nun, but she struggles with it because of <coughs> the vow of chastity specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, and it takes her a long time to determine that she she can't remain there because she can't reconcile those things. So she returns to a secular life. Um, and so it was really to kind of portray that and the nuance to that in contrast with other characters who either have different struggles or don't struggle. <laughs> like they're, you know, Zidana in a lot of ways, she's just kind of mad and it's not like she's upset because she can't observe her vow. She's kind of mad that she had to take vows. She didn't want this life. And then you have someone like Illuminata who is kind of aggravated about being forced into that life just because she feels like she didn't have much of a choice, but she is, she is quite religious and takes her vows very seriously. Um, so yeah, I think it's just to show one of many different ways that characters live life under, under the vows that they've taken. Yeah. I mean, thinking about it, almost all of the sisters that you talk to are t like focused on vocation in a different aspect. You know, Zidana's, you know, struggling with it like abrasively. Illuminata, she struggles with it, but cut, like wrestles with it to an acceptance. Um, Matilda or Matilda? Yeah. Matilda, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, she ha she realizes she needs to get out of it, but for like a legitimate reason. Like all of them are coming from different places and some are, you know, I like that the one of the great things about the character work in pentiment is it all comes across like a moral spectrum and a not even just a moral spectrum just a spectrum like if some people are tackling it from like i was forced into this and so on and so forth so i think yeah sorry if there's a lot of questions that are basically just like you did great mm. but like, thank you <laughs> yeah but but it, it's very impressive to like see that so um i did want to take a moment to Ah, gosh, this next one literally is written in flattery. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to praise the game for its theological and philosophical accuracy. Did you have any theological consultants when it came to that area of the game? So I didn't have theological consultants as such. Um, I did have um, my advisor from college, Edmund Kern, who, because... So a side effect of studying witch hunting is that you need to be fairly familiar with canon law. Um, because even though in the end, people who were found guilty of things like witchcraft were tried in, um, they were tried in secular courts and sentenced by secular authorities, there is huge overlap between ecclesiastical authorities and secular authorities. And much of the, um, you know, much of the basis of it is in canon law. So, um, you know, there's a lot of talking about what laws applied and didn't apply. Um, 
you know, I I did study the New Testament academically in college, and so I would return to that on occasion, uh, but we did not have, as it were, a theological consultant. Like, there was no one from the Catholic Church that we consulted about matters of theology, in part because most of what we understand, we needed to understand through a historical lens. So, you know, for example, a point that does come up, and I don't want to spoil anything, but it had to do with the seal of confession. Mm -hmm. And canon law on the seal of confession now is really clear, or rather, it's much more clearly defined. Like, there's a lot more specifically about, like, do not do this. And if you're if you're secular, even if you're not a priest, do not do this. Um that was not the case then. And so our sources, we, we had to take the sources not from the perspective of a Catholic now, but from Catholics then and what they wrote about. So we would look at, for example, Tentler, um, which is something, something on the eve of uh, confession on the eve of reformation um sorry if i got that wrong but it, he wrote a, uh in the early 80s he wrote a book on what was confession like around the time of the reformation which is this is very very important and uh there are things that they say and don't say in there and uh there are things that we know about the the nature of confession and the nature of the seal of confession and things like that and so we didn't consult with modern catholics because it would be from their perspective we had to go to the historical sources and try to understand it through their perspective mm -hmm. no absolutely um so uh not really a spoiler, but sort of spoilers. So at the end of Act One, there's an execution, and it's particularly brutal if you choose to watch it. Um, what do you find the artistic merit is to showing off mature content? And this isn't like a like the website poo poo's mature content, but just what sure. do you um, what do you find is the merit to being able to portray that? I guess. Um, I think that showing. You know, we do give you the option to look away, but um, you know, it's there's there's a, a story element which is, hey man, you're gonna be present, like you're gonna be present for the essentially the fruits of your labor, like you were involved, you were involved whether you want to accept it or not, you were involved in this person's condemnation to death, um, and I think that a, there's a lot there's a lot of portrayals in historical or fantasy settings about what execution was like. And, you know, they, they're kind of hand wavy about what the process is. And in the case of Pentiment, I wanted to, because we, uh, I read a fantastic book by Joel F. Harrington called The Faithful Executioner. And it is about a 16th century Bavarian executioner and what his life was like. And he kept pretty, like, remarkably uniquely remarkable um, records of his life and the executions that he performed. And so understanding how the executioner as an instrument of justice in this world operated, uh, I think is it was really fascinating for me to read about, and I wanted to portray it, not for the sake of shock, but for the sake of, of helping people understand this is what happened. Like, mm -hmm. people would be required to come see this because this is a this is an, a performance of justice that the community has to come see. In many cases, you were obligated to come see it. Um, and, but it wasn't always, you know, in a lot of cases, it's portrayed as people like happy and cheering. Um, you know, obviously, we don't know what happened at every execution. But in a lot of cases, they would be really upset to see a member of their community being killed. A lot of people thought it was unfair. Um, depending on who gets killed at the end of Act 1, you see people you know, saying that there did need to be guards present because sometimes people, if there weren't, people would try to prevent it sometimes, mm -hmm. or they would attack the condemned themselves if they thought that the execution was going to be too swift, like if it was going to be a beheading and over in one stroke. Some people were like, no, we want this guy to suffer more. Mm -hmm. Um and also that there were differences in how the executions were performed um, with a sword, with a cord. It varied, again, based on gender, um, age, relative social rank. Um, you know, with if a priest were condemned, they would be defrocked. Um, but also there was a religious authority present. There was, because, you know, you have to say last rites, you have to potentially recant for what you've done uh, before dying. And then also there is a, a very, like that whole uh, conversation at the end between the secular authority and the executioner was a way of, 
it was a way of safeguarding the executioner where the authority says this person is acting on our behalf and like i'm telling you to do it and then it was a formal way to sort of like say hey everybody i know emotions are high here but this is this is the execution of justice by someone appointed by us and i'm telling him it's okay to do it so leave him alone because a lot of cases they would not and if an executioner botched which did happen you can see it happen in one of the executions um sometimes the crowd would attack the executioner because they found it like unacceptable mm -hmm. so it, it was a wild and crazy thing and it's not shown in great detail and since we have a lot of detail on it i thought it would be illustrative to actually portray it whether or not you actually watch the event so no that's great um so uh you you know this so the maker of andre rublev andre tarkovsky so you know his name but not everyone yeah. does um he so he describes the artistic process as follows from from his book sculpting in in time <clears throat> it is a it is a mistake to talk about the artist looking for his subject in fact, the subject grows within him like a fruit and begins to demand expression. It is like childbirth. The poet has nothing to be proud of. He is not master of the situation, but a servant. For him to be aware that a sequence of such deeds is due and right, that it lies in the very nature of things, he has to have faith in the idea, for only faith interlocks the system of images. So... Basically, he insists faith is necessary for art to come forth from an artist. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on that, specifically from your perspective? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think overall he's right. Like, I don't, um, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about the process of making Pentiment, so I won't go into it in great detail. But, like, the basic idea of I want to make a historical game came in, like, 1999 like 2000 when i got in the industry but that specific form and the shape of it and like all of that it just kind of spun around over many 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 years where i had no opportunities and i had a vision but that vision changed and like it was a specific confluence of opportunities and inspirations that really resulted in being able to make pentiment and uh yeah it's something that really it's a confluence of so many influences in my life specific pieces of media specific historical events andre rublev itself i mean the structure of the story is taken from andre rublev um so i i i fully believe in that and i i do also think that in some ways i guess it depends on how you define faith but like there is a certain level of ego and arrogance to try to say, I can make this. Mm -hmm. It's, I have a picture of a thing in my mind that I believe I can make and I can share it with other people. And if you don't believe that, you're not, you're not going to do it. You're not going to try to do it. <laughs> I mean, even if you do believe it, that doesn't mean you can actually. But if you don't really believe it and believe that there's something in you that you can bring out, not by yourself, but with other people, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you don't believe that, then you're just never going to do it. Um, you're probably never going to try to do it. Um, so yes, I think that from my perspective, it was about seeing this, this, these images of this thing. And I'm a very visual person. So in a lot of cases, there are specific images of events. I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, there's very specific things where those would be anchor points where I would say, I know this is going to happen here. I don't know how we get here, but I see this. And I feel like this feels true to where we're going. Um, and I actually, I will say very early in my career, uh, when I was kind of ad hoc put in charge of finishing up a project, I overheard another designer saying, Josh doesn't know where he's going. <laughs> and I said, hold up. I said, I know exactly where I'm going. I don't know how to get there. <laughs> and that is very often the case where I, again, I have images and I have pictures and I have experiences where I said like, I know that we can make this feeling. I know that we can convey this thing. I have an idea of how to do it. I don't know how to do it, 
but I know we can get there. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's a lot of stuff like that. Like the, the, the writing thing. I remember before Pentiment was even a thing, I had an idea of a historical game where everything was handwritten out one stroke at a time. And I remember I told my girlfriend at the time about it. And she said, that sounds awful. <laughs> she says, waiting for everything to write out stroke by stroke sounds absolutely <laughs> miserable and not fun. And I said, I understand what you're saying, but like, I think that there's probably a way that we can do it that would feel like it captured the physicality of writing without it being annoying. Mm -hmm. And I hope we found it. And by the way, the answer truly, this might sound weird, is 20% of the way through a character, the next character starts. So you will have like four or five characters in progress at any given point in time. Um, and that was kind of the solution, but it was, and that's what the thing is like when we first started it, it was unbearably slow. And I was like, okay, okay, it is slow, but how can we, how can we ca keep this physicality, but make it not annoying? And if you speed it up too much, you lose the individual strokes. So we can't do that. So it kept going back to this, like, here's what I'm trying to capture. Here's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, we just worked together and we found it. So yes, there is a certain amount of faith that we can get to the image, get to the experience, even if you don't know how to get there. Absolutely. Tolkien has this great lecture called on fairy stories, where he's talking a lot about like, basically, that's where he coins the coins the term you catastrophe, as well as the idea of sub creation, which is the idea of like, you know, as like, we're made in the image of our maker. So like, what does that mean? What's the image of our maker? Well, he makes things. So that means <laughs> we also want to make things. So like when we're sub creating, it's that idea of we have these images in our head. How do we put them on paper? How do we put them in a game? How do we so on and so forth? So um, if you haven't read it, it's a very good lecture. And it, it sounds yeah, very interesting. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's typical Tolkien in, in, in the sense where it's like, at least for me, it's like I didn't understand it until my second read through, really, and I parsed some of it on the way. It's interesting um, you should say. Sorry if I may. No, go ahead. Add one. It's interesting you should say that because Smith of Wooten Major, which is, or I, you know, obviously I loved it enough to get it tattooed on my arm. Uh, but Smith Smithson, the main title character, he receives a star from fairy on his forehead. And he keeps it and carries it with him as a gift, sort of from the realm of fairy. But while he has it, he as a blacksmith, everything he makes is imbued with this like kind of basically fairy beauty. Oh. And um, and he sings while he works and people gather around to listen to him. I also sing while I work. Oh, um, nice. But it but it it felt very much like this idea of and at the end of the story, sp spoiler minor, he passes it on to another generation. He wants to keep it. And the fairy tells him it's not for you forever. You have mm -hmm. to pass it on to someone else. And the reason why it resonated so much with me is like, I want to create things and I want to pass on these things in my head, but also I want that to inspire other people. So I think I feel a, a great deal of, uh, that That's that sounds very, I, I believe in that. <laughs> Bella wanted to show up for the interview. My cat's now being shy. No, no yeah. objections from me. <laughs> well, that does actually bring us right to time. And um, so I just wanted to do the quick plug of just saying that Pentiment is out now for Nintendo Switch and PlayStation 5. And obviously it continues to be on Xbox Game Pass. Pass. <laughs> I reviewed it back in November and to keep it short, I'd heavily recommend it. So Josh, I just wanted to thank you again for your time and for your openness. It was a real pleasure speaking with you, and I'm looking forward to future projects like Avowed and whatever else Obsidian's got cooking. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I hope we get the chance to talk again in the future, and I hope you have a great one, okay? You too. All right. See ya. Bye.